Hello and welcome back to Dreamloop Podcasts. And uh, this time we're going to be talking about unreliable narrators in games. And uh, with me this time is Tommy and Ville. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hello. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I recently started playing a classic game that I never played before, System Shock One, and. Uh, we ended up having some conversations uh, about how the narration and the player's role goes on in that game. And I'm not even very far into the game as of now, but I'm already, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about how the game, how the game pulls you in. Because uh, it appears that uh, e- even even more than in System Shock 2, in that game you really have to pay attention to uh, what uh, the audio logs of the ship's crew uh, are saying to you, what, what kinds, of, kinds of clues they are giving you. Just to clarify, the premise is of course that uh, uh, the space station or the spaceship is uh, uh, it's derelict and it's ruled by a rogue AI who thinks that she's some kind of a god. and. Uh, and everybody's dead, and you're the uh, basically the sole survivor, and you have to uh, you have to find out what the hell's going on, how to how to get out of that mess. And uh, so you find the uh, corpses of the dead crew members and their audio logs, and uh, there is no quest arrow or anything. There's not even a list of objectives for you to do. You have to basically figure out everything on your own. And uh, for me, that's very very intriguing and it really grips me as a player and uh, uh, there is there was one one scene I'm sorry for this little monologue here but <laughs> I'm going to tell the story uh, there was one scene that really really actually sparked me uh, this is a little bit of a, a minor spoiler so and this episode is is going to be full of spoilers so so if you don't want spoilers about uh, about games maybe Maybe skip this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Great marketing. Yes. Anyway, uh, so in System Shock One, there there is a moment in the beginning of the game that uh, you find out that uh, uh, the AI, the rogue AI showdown, is trying to use some kind of a huge laser uh, laser cannon to destroy a city on Earth, and. Uh, uh, you r- read the yeah, you listen to the audio logs of the of the crew members and it turns out that some of them uh, were beginning to uh, they were beginning to find out that uh, they could use this laser cannon to their advantage and what things they have to do to reconfigure the cannon so that it doesn't point to the city anymore and instead, it would point to the station itself and its shields or something like this. Uh, uh, I haven't solved this puzzle yet, so I don't, I don't know what all there is going to come yet. But uh, at least uh, I, I did find out <laughs> that uh, since the laser is first pointed uh, onto Earth, and there is a, there's a switch for firing the laser. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can you can find the, the the firing switch and you can pull it and that's a game over, and this it's just plain and simple. It's just uh, there's a little uh, message from Shodan there, and you can <laughs> you can actually see a little picture of the uh, city getting hit by the laser blast, and that's a that's a game over. And that was I th- I thought that was fantastic because you really really you have to take seriously what you're being told because I mean it's if you listen to the logs and you really take it hard it's obvious that you shouldn't pull the pull the switch before you have realigned the laser mm-hmm. but you can do it if you don't pay attention so like that's that was one thing that really gripped me and, and how we got from there to unreliable narrators was quite interesting because of course that's that's a reliable narrator because you were you were constantly told you shouldn't yeah. pull the lever but that's more the idea that 
as players we have such like, we're so used to, for example, if there's a switch, you're gonna pull it, uh, modern players especially. Like, of course you're gonna do that. And then that leads to in, into a game over. Another thing we don't necessarily like to do as modern players is read a lot of text and, and you mm -hmm. know, try to understand what the text is saying and stuff like that. So that's kind of like the, in a way, that's the opposite of an unreliable narrator, but that led, led into an interesting discussion of of unreliability in general, because there you could feel, like a, as a modern player, you pull that switch and you get a game for over, you could feel that in a way the game, you know, game is unfair, it lied to you in a way, like, how, why can't mm. I pull a switch? Because in all the other games I can pull a switch and it's fine. Uh, and I, I guess that's how we ended up in the whole, because like unreliable narration doesn't necessarily have to be that there's like an actual narrator telling you lies or whatever. It can be that yeah. the mechanics of the game itself, for example, misleading you in some way. Well, I guess um, one of one good uh, example of an unreliable, unreliable narrator or even a hostile narrator is Stanley Parable, which should be something that even the modern players have come across with even I guess that's a game that um, quite a few people have experience of, even though they would normally not play a lot of like story-heavy games or something, because that was a huge thing at some point. But in that game, as many people will know, uh, the narrator tries to get you from the beginning of the game to the one true ending or one ending of the game by uh, telling you what to do and if you start to do things the way that he doesn't want you to do it, then he will start getting confused or start to get you back on the path or or turns turns hostile towards you and just tries to get you killed or something. And um, I think that was sort of a, it came in a at a time when that sort of a thing was was uh, not done that much. So I guess that's one thing why it became such a big thing and I guess the second one is that it's it's um, it's really well written and all the reactions that the narrator has for whatever you do are uh, very interesting and they feel really natural in well in the context of the game I think that's for example a very good popular, like relatively modern example. And I think it, that was around the time when we started this modern trend in games in general about kind of like like subverting expectations and kind of like meta narrative of mm -hmm. games kind of like being aware that they are games and, you know, playing playing with that and, and like playing, playing with things that we take for granted in regards to games, such as, you know, the whole thing that uh, if there's a lever, a player is going to pull it. For example, mm -hmm. and then out of that, yeah. we have gotten a lot of recent recent games. Like I guess, for example, Undertale is a is a really big, relatively recent example. And then there's mm -hmm. uh, Doki Doki Literature Club, which is even more recent stuff like yeah. that. But those are well, I guess those also deal with the whole unreliable narrator aspect too. But yeah. there's mm -hmm. also a lot, lot more there, of course. Then there's like everybody knows Portal series, mm -hmm. and in Portal. Glados is a is a liar, a, patho a pathological liar, and uh, actually that brought to my mind an interesting thing about uh, these types of uh, narrations. That uh, usually when there's a villain in a story, they should be well. Usually they are trying to somehow somehow deceive the main character. The protagonist usually and uh, with that in mind it's a little even when you stop to think about it it's a little weird that the player themselves don't have to uh, they don't have to put any effort into trying to to try to overcome the fact that the villain is trying to deceive them the, the uh, plot of the game takes care of it for you mm -hmm. so so th this is kind of uh, uh in gameplay where, where in, in a gameplay where where the player actually has to take care of a lot of things to survive against unreliable narrators it just becomes that much more interesting to me while i do understand that it might not always translate to a very concise 
uh, gameplay experience. And so it's a very, I suppose that it's a niche thing, yeah, but I like I, it very much. Yeah, and I think it ties in with the thing we've discussed before in our, our stuff about how people want different things from games. And there's a, I, I would argue, maybe the largest single chunk of the audience tends to be people who just want a easy to enjoy experience that is, you know, meets their expectations. It, they ha they're ha having fun as they, you know, experience it. it, it and like they don't really want to be challenged and they don't really want to be, and they don't want to be outsmarted by the, the entertainment product, so to speak, either. So I yep. think for that chunk of people, stuff like this is not necessarily that good but i think even there it could work if it's if it's done right or if it's done just as a trait of a specific character for example like mm -hmm. one game for example that really sort of plays with the idea of this in a way is, is witcher 3 uh, that was of course also very popular in the sense that there is never like an outright uh, it feels anyway that there is never an outright wrong or outright right way to do things no mm -hmm. no good or evil it's just shades of gray and then gerald's whole the main character's whole characterization is that he he doesn't want to make decisions he doesn't want to pick with between good and evil stuff like that but then he kept keeps being forced into these situations and that's really interesting too because there's you know if you play that game through a second time and you pick options you didn't pick and you see how the star story goes and you almost feel like there's like you know two completely different stories that both you know like characters act kind of like differently and you might learn mm -hmm. something from characters motivations if you do you know like if, if you do go go through it two ways you go okay that's why that character did that and stuff like that it's quite interesting yeah you can find uh completely new aspects of some characters if you choose to uh, like say something different to them or uh, do the quest in a different way then some character that you completely hate the first time can actually seem a much more um, sympathetic uh, or like uh, you feel much more empathetic towards them. Um, I have a character in mind, but I don't want to talk about him, him or her because... Um, Matthias hasn't played Matthias the game. Matthias hasn't played the game, so... <laughs> and I, I think that's I one of the... I appreciate it. I think that's one of the biggest uh, things that I liked about the game was that those like character interactions and and how there's so much backstory to each each character that you meet, uh, no matter how big or small their part is in the main storyline or even the side quests. And also how consistent they are in personality, because mm -hmm. often in games, if a game was to do something like this, where you have two options, like the characters change, not may change entirely, but in Witcher 3 it still feels like they're the same characters, you just see a different aspects of their mm -hmm. personality, or you see something you didn't see before, but it all feels like it fits into the big picture of the character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, also on the topic of Witcher 3, or the Witcher series in general, uh, the Geralt is a very strongly defined character, <clears throat> whereas in many games nowadays, it seems that players, they almost really wish to have a, like an empty slate kind of ca character so that they can maybe immerse themselves more into the game world rather than into a role of a certain predetermined character. But um, uh, referring to what I, what I said earlier, I think it, uh, it fits better if, uh, you, know, you know, the situation where a uh, main, main, main villain is trying to deceive the protagonist. I think in a, in a, a game where, for example, Witcher, uh, it would make sense that uh, since Geralt is a is a character that already exists, he has a he has a face, he has a personality that is not yours. It's the character and not you, per se. Uh, in in that kind of a situation, it would make more sense to me that uh, Geralt is able to like uh, avoid being avoid being <laughs> lied to by the the villain and so that he, he the gerald's character sort of keeps the story on rails so that you don't end up in a game over scenario just because you didn't know that the that the main villain was actually deceiving you and that's and how it tends to, to work you. work of course in general because like with all the all the magical monsters and stuff like that like gerald will by default most of the time know more about them than you as the player will mm -hmm. yeah uh, 
which is actually quite cool way of doing it, like cool mm-hmm. way of showing the world in a sense is that, you know, he, he, you know, you had to go around and examine like a murder scene or something. And then Geralt will come to a conclusion that way he will, you know, grunt out as, as he, as he does. And you as the player will learn of the world as that's happening. It's, uh, I mean, it's nothing revolutionary, but I, I really like how it's done where it's more like I get to control the character and I, I get to make choices, but it's still like a very specific type of story. And I don't get to derail, derail it entirely, which is what people tend to like to do. Again, tying with the whole like large chunk of audience, as you said, like some people might not um, like, or well, you didn't say that, but like the, the thing is that some people might not like that there is a clear, well-defined character. And I think one big thing is that people want that clean, clean slate because they just, you know, they don't want to learn about a character. They just want to jump in and do whatever they want. And they want to go off the rails and do stupid stuff and like wander in the wilderness and stuff like that. I think that's one of the reasons why, for example, Bethesda games are so popular is because you can basically do anything and the game experience is as good as it's going to be, basically. Like it caters to such a wide audience. Whereas in Witcher, like, you know, it's you have to t- assume the role of Gerald for it to make any sense. Yeah, and you know, everybody, everybody loves the Bethesda adv- adventure games, and for a good reason. But they they don't have a real protagonist. They do have, you know, Skyrim has the Dragonborn, and everybody knows what he looks like in the promo art. And mm-hmm. Fallout Four has the vault dweller uh but uh you know it's not the same as having having like venom snake in (laughs) mgs5 or something like that yeah i I think i think if i can insert something here i think i think that's one of the reasons why there was such a backlash to fallout 4 when they introduced the like hey this is the first bethesda rpg character that has a voice voice and a and and uh, like some sort of like a personality, I guess. Though they, it's he, he's he or she is supposed to have, uh, or multi multiple different uh, personalities. Yeah, actually, now that I think of it, um, the character actually has a lot of uh, many different personalities at the same time, and and he or she comes up like. It seems like a complete, um, like a psychopath. If you think about how they talk <laughs> in uh-huh. the game, because you can pick like, okay, sarcastic or uh, angry, or uh, I guess one is, I guess one should be called whiny. But like, um, yeah, I, I think that was the biggest uh, outcry. I, I think I saw about that game, like, because yeah. previously, previously, people could really insert themselves into the character's shoes. And uh, now their imagination is ruined by this uh, voice uh, yeah. who doesn't sound anything like they thought they would sound like. Like my initial character always may make an, like this grizzled old dude in better stuff all life games. And then it's, you know, obviously a young guy's voice. So I ended mm-hmm. up remaking my character because it took me... Like it lets you make your character look old and, you know, give them gray hair, stuff like that. But then you mm-hmm. don't get to change the voice. Um, so it was quite immersion breaking and it's really annoying because obviously they try to make it still make it sandboxy like you, know, mm-hmm. you can't simultaneously have a defined character and then let the player choose unless you have like a ridiculously massive writing department writing like intersecting different stories and even then it will get weird if the player in every single conversation gets to pick like kind of like on which which mm-hmm. storyline they want to be at this time because yeah. there is kind of a personality to the Church in Fallout 4 if you always kind of pick the snarky answers. Mm-hmm. There is some personality mm-hmm. there, but that's the only personality that I have. Outside of that, it's super generic. And even then, it's kind of like, like then you don't really have a choice because there's o- always only one sarcastic answer, and that's yeah. it. So it's, you don't really get a choice. And also, that's, that's a little bit what happened in uh, uh, Metal Gear Solid, Solid 5, because the uh, there's a, I mean, what you said before about character, like also being sandboxy, but then also kind of having a personality. It, I think, well, I, I have, as far as I understand, there was a lot of, a lot of t- trouble behind the production of that game, and and uh, uh, 
Kojima's uh, Go- Kojima's relation with uh, Konami somehow mm-hmm. went wrong. I, I I don't know all the de- details behind it, but uh, as far as I understand, the game isn't really complete. But just judging from what we got, it really feels when you, when you're playing the game, it really feels that uh, they tried to go for two things at once having snake being a snake again mm-hmm. and also also being a empty slate for the player to kind of uh, inhabit and mm-hmm. <laughs> well it didn't work out that well for me i mean i loved playing the game it was absolutely gra- great but uh, it really fell short on the aspect of who snake is and mm-hmm. well snakes well in the, in 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 that that time period at least Mm-hmm. Yeah, and since I, I think it was um, the idea why they took um, uh, Kiefer Sutherland there was that they wanted to uh, display more emotions and more acting uh, through the facial expressions that Snake does. And if you look at the lines spoken by Snake in that game, it's way, way, way less than in any other Metal Gear game. Yeah. He doesn't really speak at all. He just stands there. He's more like a silent protagonist. And then at some points he just says something and it just sounds always a, a little bit off if, you, if you've if you played the other games. It just yeah. seems like a completely different person. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Though, um, back to talking about narr- narr- narrators. Um, uh, I actually read this interesting thing that I never realized when I was playing the game, actually. But um, in the game Black, that I think we mentioned at some point as well, uh, previously in these podcasts. I think we have, uh, yeah. There's this... Um, the gameplay is basically you just go in different levels and shoot up shit and lots of enemies. And between the missions, you are shown these cutscenes where this um, soldier is being interrogated about his doings in who knows where. And uh, I read this um, small info piece about the game, and uh, I only now realize that he's actually, during the gameplay sections, he's exaggerating all the aspects of the uh, wars or conflicts he's been in. And he makes all his uh, fellow soldiers seem completely useless and himself as a sort of a killing machine, uh, just laying bullets, like hundreds and thousands of bullets down the range uh, towards the hundreds and thousands of enemy soldiers that just keep keep on pouring from every nook and cranny. And um, it's sort of, uh, it's nice that um, now that I read about this, it sort of makes sense. But back then, I had no idea. I just thought that, okay, this story is just a throwaway thing, like, whatever. Let's just kill some more bad guys. <laughs> so I guess this sort of... Uh, I'm not sure if it's an un, like an um, unreliable narrator, or if it's just something that they uh, sort of came, came up with anyway. Like, I'm not sure if it was actually written to be like this or if it's just if this is someone else's um like uh uh how, how would you say it like if someone interpretation else, yeah interpretation that's the word i was yeah. looking for thanks so if you're yeah. you're basically suggesting that the narration regarding their potential unreliable narration is unreliable mm. yeah <laughs> basically yes <laughs> but it's it's a cool idea because that's another thing often is that sometimes it's hard to say whether certain ambiguity is intended or not. And authors often after the fact will come out and say, you know, things uh, mm-hmm. and say like, no, 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 that's how it meant. Or, you know, or, or people come up with really cool solutions and then the author backs them or whatever. Uh, well, not, not maybe in the case of unreliable narration, but in, in regards of mm-hmm. in, rega- in situation where the narration is ambiguous. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, unreliable narration is also one one part of it is like telling telling the truth, but not all of it, and also like like you said, interpreting things wrong or mm. you know, for example, a child doesn't 
understand everything an, an adult does so their view of the truth so to speak is always interpreted in a sort of mm, unreliable way and that makes them natural unreliable narrators mm. which is uh, i think a very <laughs> common theme in movies <coughs> and 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 also maybe in some games mm -hmm. and in the case of the case of black is also interesting in that that's kind of like using game mechanics to convey unreliable narration so to speak which is what the mm -hmm. original conversation we had with Matthias about this was also more about like it's not even traditional narration necessarily well or it, it is but like the narration is also the gameplay mm -hmm. which is which is very interesting like the and uh, and I think that's also very ahead of ahead of its time so to speak because that's of course now now a very popular thing um mm -hmm games are experimenting with that and like incorporating gameplay mechanics into the game game world uh, stuff like that and like what does that mean and for example one really good example of this is um, for what little I know of it is is near Automata but of course I haven't beaten it yet <laughs> or you haven't played it that much so we can't really discuss that know, one either yeah yeah and I, I haven't played it so but I know that much that it's uh, it's supposed to be a bit of a mindfuckery in all, all kinds of different ways yeah um, I'm also waiting to get to play it someday <laughs> so none of us have actually played that one so we can discuss it because none of us actually know what happened. Yeah, we can speculate. <laughs> yeah, we can speculate. But um, yeah, another game that came to mind, which actually actually does what Black probably intended to do a bit better, uh, mostly because it doesn't take itself too seriously, and I, I think uh, it's more um, aware of its of itself being a game. And the game is Call of Juarez Gunslinger, oh. which actually is a very interesting game it, the shooting mechanics are okay like a little better than mediocre uh, but the how they wrap up the whole thing is that in the beginning of the game you are basically a guy who walks into a bar and starts drinking and starts telling stories about his uh, uh, like how he has uh, met so many bandits and Indians and whatever and shoot shot them all and like the longer you go into the game, the drunker the guy gets. So he star starts like telling all weird stories and <laughs> and the like. Yeah, there were like hundreds of Indians and and then I shot them all. And then someone's like, no, that's not possible. And then it's, okay, yeah, there was maybe ten. And <laughs> then it kind of rewinds you back to the start of the level. And then there's only ten Indians. <laughs> and that that's really kept the game going really nicely even though the game like otherwise the game mechanics weren't that um, like incredible but i really enjoyed it from the start to finish yeah but well, there was there was a similar thing in dragon age 2 uh, in the very beginning the oh uh, yeah the i guess he's a dwarven guy called varric he he exaggerates uh, some some parts of what happened in the past but <laughs> but actually the only part i remember is <laughs> that he also exaggerated the the breast size of a female character oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i first thought it was a bug but then i later realized <laughs> that uh it's actually uh the unrelatable narrator that warwick is being it was yeah. really it was sort of subtle it wasn't highlighted in any way yeah yeah but it just was there <laughs> but since since games are an interactive media uh do you think that for a for an unreliable narration to be uh so to speak real do you think in games the player has to somehow um, take action in order to avoid something bad happening or or otherwise because you know well, basically, a, a lot of plot twists could be, they could be unreliable narration, but, it, you know, it can't be that simple. So, like, do you think that you have to, the player has to have the opportunity to somehow uh, m take action in order to avoid 
I mean, of course, we are abusing the term unreliable narration horribly here uh, mm. because uh, most of those scenarios are not exactly narration. I guess what we are mm. more talking about the, uh, in this scenario, uh, that case would be like unreliable instruction. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's a, that's a good word. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but in, in that scenario, I guess that would rely on the player taking or not taking action. Um, but I think that's that's the more interesting thing. Is what one thing we discussed we haven't really talked about here is like potential for stuff uh, like this in games. Things where, for example, you have uh, some sort of tutorial like voice talking to you, for example, and then you know that voice pops in every every now and then throughout the game. But then what if that voice, for example, is an actual character with some sort of sinister agenda? that is never shown to a player, no other character in the game acknowledges the voice in any way. It seems like it's uh, it's the usual, you know, press A button to do this and this and this. But then at some point in the game, it starts getting like more sinister and sinister and stuff like that. Like something like, I'm sure somebody has done that and I'm just not aware mm -hmm. of it. But for example, that would be... <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I guess, yeah. Well, uh, well, I guess it wasn't an instructor, instructor voice, but it uh, the character yeah. there does a lot of those things. Mm. Yeah. But I'm talking, I think talking like almost like, you know, you get a tutorial and it just mm -hmm. gives you like boxes and screen. I talk, just talks about pressing the A button and stuff like that. that things that are obviously out of game. But then that very same voice, while still kind of out of the game, starts, you know, misleading you in the actual game. Yeah. Um, actually, Metal Gear Solid 2. Mm, yeah. Mm. The Colonel, Colonel and Rose are sort of doing that, I think. Yeah. Now that you mention it, yes, in the mm. towards the end. That that's a really scary mindfuck <laughs> section, by the way. <laughs> I still remember my my friend from uh from uh mm, from, from school back in the back in the days when we were kids. Grade school. Uh probably. Yeah, I think it's school. called great grade school. Great school. Great school. <laughs> uh we uh he he told me uh, one day that this that he was playing he was playing MGS2 f uh, last night and he got to the end part and he was like super it was got super scary and 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 really really creepy suddenly and they, <laughs> this the the colonel and Rose started like calling me repeatedly on the codec and <laughs> you know they just keep ringing and ringing and every time I answer they they just say something really really random like mm. t uh, like actually totally random and they're like <coughs> colonel's face is a skull and and like and at one point they he just calls you and says that Raiden you have been playing the game for too long shut down the <laughs> console now and then and he and, then, and he actually told me that he actually turned off <laughs> turned off the game and went to sleep because it was like he had been also playing for so long that it <laughs> i guess it kind of got under his skin <laughs> so okay. i can totally relate with that that was that's one of my um, most memorable moments. I think that the Metal Gear Two ending, like uh, first it goes like haywire. It's sort of first it's sort of funny. Then it gets really creepy, and then afterwards they sort of like talk to you for thirty minutes or something about really philosoph philosophical things, and then you're like, yeah. oh my god, how am I supposed to feel at this moment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's the old school Metal Gear Solid for mm -hmm. you. Mm. I guess that's a good example of a series that likes to use all these mindfuckery tricks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, like I think maybe one of you two guys uh, mentioned Psycho Mantis mm. in MGS yeah. One. That's a little bit maybe like uh, unreliable instruction. I I actually like this term a lot because uh, I was thinking. What could be a good name for, for the thing that I was, I was so hyped about in System Shock, mm -hmm. like what 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 could be the name of this well phenomenon or or like game design mechanism or what do you want to call it, but that 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 sounds like, like pretty good and I'm I'm very interested in seeing in the future what kinds of games will we get where this aspect is highlighted more, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be highlighted in as in being the main focus of the game i think then uh i think in that kind of a case it it might even lose some of its charm but but uh i'd like to see it implemented more more like deeply so that there is 
there you, there is weight weight in that that kind of a system because for me at least it's super immersive that w w when i notice in a game that i'm being faced with these kinds of uh like puzzles and and problems and just just moments of gameplay where i am actually challenged to just use my use my brains in inside the game's lore Th mm. then then that that's an instant turning point where where uh, i realize that i'm now i'm like totally inside the game and that's that's what what i'm usually looking for when i'm playing a game in any way that's actually a good seg segue because we haven't done it yet uh, to mention Dark Souls, uh, not Dark Souls <laughs> necessarily, <laughs> but um, Bloodborne, because um, I did a thing where, because I'm pretty certain at this point it's never going to come out on PC and I don't have a PlayStation, so I really wanted to play that game, but I ended up, well at first I wasn't that interested in it, the setting didn't seem interesting, then I started hearing from people, but now it's really good, then I watched the streamer play it, and I ended up reading this 100-page um, essay about the story and, and narrative stuff like that of it, that was really really cool. I don't want to get too much into that detail because I guess Matthias, you still have to, you haven't finished it or anything. Yeah, but, I haven't. So. But it has, um, as far as I can tell, it has this aspect of you really have to get into the lore because you start uh, once you start doing that, you'll start seeing like uh, at least according to the interpretation of, for example, this essay uh, and the streamer I was watching stuff like that. Um, you st or even the littlest things in the world, like how something is positioned, or, or how what clothes some churches are wearing, or or you know what color something in the UI is in a certain situation, stuff like that. All of these will actually have lore implications that you can then deduce things from. But ultimately, it's still like open-ended. Like some things don't have. Um, like a concrete explanation, like one one specific explanation. This is how it happened. There's always ambiguity, and that's really cool to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good way to include both the clean slate and some defined character. Mm. Well, that character as as in a person here, but you know, some 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 kind of a defined shape. And in a way, like Bethesda does something similar with the little environmental storytelling that they like to do only it's like it's very like there is it when you know like most of the world doesn't have it and when it's there it's sort of like oh that's cute it's kind of like you know looking at some map maker made, made a map in i don't know like a rts game or something you play through it and you see them use props in a cool way and you're like that's that's funny you know like that's the feeling i often get from the better things they're cool and they make the world feel a little bit more alive but it should be like not just you know a note on a table that tells you like the text in it is is funny and there's like a little scene around it it should be more in incorporated into the world i feel um, yeah yeah but that's one of the areas where their games are quite decent in, in, in the sense that well there are there are others of course but like one one where they might even be outstanding in that you can find these little stories that reward you for exploring and you, you find the little you know you find the garden gnomes and the teddy bears and stuff like that you know positioned in, in weird positions as sort of easter eggs and stuff like that that's quite, but I that's just, not really in in lore necessarily. I would love to know what what's the what's the thing with the goddamn teddy bears in Fallout Four? They're just creeping <laughs> me out every time I see them. They're doing something <laughs> really weird. You mean the like you mean the monkeys with the symbols? No, no, no. no, no, no. no there's no, like the teddy, teddy bear <laughs> toys, and they have made these little scenes with them, like. I remember one where like one teddy bear has tied another teddy bear down to like railroad tracks, <laughs> and then there's one that's like um, using a bone cutter like on a tight down teddy bear and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And like they are always like most of the time you, they're really easy to miss because they are just you know crap on the floor. And sometimes yeah. they are also kind of like in out of the way places. But there's a lot of this. Yeah, if you play with lots of explosives, I guess you might blow them away mm -hmm. from their original positions because they are just clutter items. Mm. But um, or if you bump into them, they will lose their positions and yeah. fly everywhere. Because or because it's havoc have have physics. Yeah. <clears throat> or I guess I no. Actually, actually, it's that's that's unfair for havoc. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just a it's bit creation thing, engine. So. Yes. Implementation of havoc. Havoc. Yes. Havoc but is I have. Good. But I have to <laughs> agree that that uh, I think Beth Bethesda have actually like improved a lot 
uh, in this little scene building game by game and because in I feel like in Fallout 4 there's these tiny little set pieces everywhere like you go to you go to a dungeon or whatever you do almost there's almost guaranteed uh, some kind of a setting yeah. somewhere like like some you know well you can see some skeletons sitting on sofas everywhere but but uh, I'm I'm talking about like what you said like this for example, a table where where there's clutter arranged in a way where it forms some kind of a meaningful message to you without without needing you, the player, to actually read and written note in any way. And I also agree that I, I would like to see it being more expanded. Now now right now there are like these singular little isolated things sprinkled everywhere, but uh, I kind of wish that they would more often take you on some kind of a little uh, emergent adventure or be like because uh, <clears throat> very often they are like kind of like they are specific kind of like set in a specific room or whatever it feels like these things are always contained into like a, a cell so to speak there mm-hmm. are some examples like one right one that i remember from fallout 4 when you first get to start going to diamond city you will very often run into this scene at um there's a bank and the back wall has been like blown up yeah. and there's like two skeletons and they have like a bag full of money and like they're one of them is like half hanging from the, the hole and stuff. So the implication is that they were just robbing the bank when the bombs fell, for example. And that's like why that, that kind of has lore implications. It's an actual thing that happened in mm-hmm. the world and like stuff like, like stuff like this. That's, that's quite cool. But of course, I think why Bethesda has gotten better about this because they did do it in their previous games too, is that they put more people into actually doing this because <laughs> yeah. if i remember correctly uh but don't quote me on this in oblivion there was one guy who made all the dungeons and then in skyrim it was more people and then i think eight, in i think more i think it was eight eight people who yeah made the all the dungeons in skyrim and i, I remember oh. then even kind of like using this as a selling point because everybody basically hated dungeons in in oblivion Morrowind mm-hmm. people didn't really that much care, but then Oblivion mm-hmm. was kind of like, because they were all so samey in a way. So then, I mean, not that Skyrim is necessarily much better because it's always just going to be, I mean, it's been long since I played Skyrim, but most what I can remember is just, it's always going to be this like loopy thing where you get a shortcut to the end, uh, to the yeah, beginning and yeah. the very end. And at yeah. one point there's going to be three like obelisk things that you have to spin yeah. around so that they, yeah. in a completely obvious manner, so that the gate opens and then there's a lot yeah. of Draugr. And sometimes there is uh, Dwemer constructs instead, and then the area just goes on forever and forever and forever, and you keep mm-hmm. getting into a new cave, a new cave, and now there's Falmer, and now there's more Dwemer, and even though he has been full for five areas. And, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, that's Skyrim. Fuck, fuck the Falmers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, once you start going to Blackreach, your, your inventory is going to be full for mm-hmm. a really annoyingly long time. <laughs> yeah, um, I think Bethesda they sort of they were going to a better direction with Skyrim in the whole world building thing and for example if you look at the main quest from Oblivion to Skyrim I think that what well, that's where they went to a worse direction I think the um, the mainline quests have have gotten worse but the in world like the world building stuff has gotten better Mm. Mm. which is sort of interesting i think like the side quests small quests side quests have maybe arguably gotten better or at least there's Mm. more content there but then the big quests have gotten like more boring um Mm -hmm. i mean oblivion i never beat it because the whole you had to go to the whatever oblivion and and find these gems and stuff it was so repetitive and boring i never felt like doing it skyrim Mm -hmm. main quest i did beat but for example i never did anything with the civil war storyline and that's not main quest but that suffers mm-hmm. from the same syndrome of just, I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they're not very good at writing people. <laughs> yeah. I think I mean, that's it. Like, because they're, yeah, that, that's really the bottom line is that they're just aren't characters. 
Mm-hmm. Like they just have no personality. They have no motivations. Now, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they need an unreliable narrator to make it interesting or something <laughs> to, maybe, to bring yeah. it back to the <laughs> to that topic. But really, that's the thing. Like, I mean, does anybody ever lie to you in a bit? Uh, there are there are uh, instances because one of the most important or interesting kind of characters in Elder Scrolls role lore in the mainline games is Shergarath, of course, mm-hmm. and he always mm-hmm. has these crazy things going on and stuff like that. But that's like a single one thing, and even there, it feels. Uh, kind of like forced or whatever. Yeah, I, I think in Skyrim there's like two characters have that have actual character. One is uh, Shergarath, and the second one is the crazy jester dude who's with the Dark Brother. Who, oh yeah, true, Cicero. And, yeah. Well, and their personality is being batshit crazy. Yeah, because my crazy people are the easiest type of mm-hmm. personality to write. Uh, but, like in, but, and, and voice act and direct and stuff like that like in, yeah. interesting crazy people so to speak it's especially I mean Cicero is like come on like crazy jester person like you just look at all the incarnation of Joker uh, from mm-hmm. Batman stuff like that there's so much material to draw from to do that it's quite a tropey tropey mm-hmm. thing already but yeah he did have a character but outside of that they had a fucking like golden dragon living on top of the mountain that you can talk to and he has no personality whatsoever yeah. <laughs> for example yeah. Yeah. I, I i sort of felt like i want to go and kill him like yeah because right. he, he feels like an old person he's just in his yeah. like old person <laughs> home on top of the mountain he's like oh will you bring me some tea or whatever like i just don't care <laughs> fun fact did you know that he he was voice acted by the mario voice actor oh no I mean, that's, that's more interesting than the actual character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is really like off topic already, but I just <laughs> wish that the the dragons were made more outlandish. They, yeah. Like, uh, and they, like, they could, it yeah. wouldn't ha- even have been that difficult, in my opinion. In my, I mean, in just my do not them so the, humble opinion. Because they're evil dragons. Just do the whole like um, red dragons from D and D thing, where they're like yeah. super pompous and full of themselves and like overconfident mm-hmm. and like kind of dickish and like, like or and look at how they did smog in in you know the Hobbit. Um, which of course was after Skyrim, but anyway, uh, I mean in yeah. the book, for example, so, like there's so much that, and, and that's not a difficult trope to do, but they just have basically no personality other than like <laughs> I'm going to kill you because I'm a monster in a video game. Yeah, they sort of <laughs> just wa- they just wa- were there. They just they never said anything uh, that was of any importance that or that I could remember. And I think it's also has to be partially. This has turned into rant about Skyrim, but <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, I guess that doesn't really matter. Um, and like, like one of the things is that it's just bad voice direction because all the characters mm-hmm. sound like they don't give a fuck. Like <laughs> a true. dragon, yep. and then they're just running around in a circle <laughs> or whatever. Uh, it doesn't help that it's like an accent that's kind of like recognizable as. Mm-hmm. bad oh, yeah. for us because it's kind of like close to a Finnish or Scandinavian accent which to us sounds unprofessional and like yeah. it just sounds like people don't talk like that other than you know my my grandpa or whatever uh, so it's kind of like or you know stupid politicians on the TV and then that with uh, writing and the voice direction just makes it feel so kind of like mm-hmm. so it just feels like nobody in that world cares at all about anything yeah I, I really, really hate that because it would be so easy to fix in when you're recording the voices. I mean, obviously, I'm not a professional voice uh, voice acting director or anything, but how hard can it be to actually just tell the actors to shout when they have something to shout about? Mm. You know, mm. it, it like like you said, Bill, it, it's really... It, it feels so uh, immersion-breaking when they... When they see a dragon or a, some kind of a monster, and what what they do is sounds like they just don't don't give a damn. Yeah, or they are like like me, where I can't really yell because I live in a block of flats and my neighbors will hear. So it's kind of like it's kind of like that. They're afraid to actually actually yell, for example. And one thing they could also start taking into attention into account more nowadays in games because now we have resources more than 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 ten years ago. Uh, the distance between characters mm. like like well this goes also into pre-production matters and how well you can be prepared when you you start recording voices and everything but too often in games we see the things where uh two people are like what once one is standing on the top of a cliff and the other is down in the valley and they're like they're kind of they're supposed to be like 
talking to each other so that they can hear. Mm. But but they aren't like raising their voices at all. And it's just I mean, I know this is a small thing and probably not not even half of people really care, but it would be so it would be so easy to to <laughs> to make better. Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering why. Why 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 don't why not developers pay attention to yeah, this? Yeah, it's 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 really weird. And especially because there are so many like if you look at goddamn children's cartoons for example that have amazingly good voice actors uh, and so some of those same voice actors you you will you know then hear in video games for example but there it's yeah. often very i guess it's just you know bad direction or or i guess it's also the matter of that in a video game you especially an open world video game you might have to record so much stuff and you mm. because you know when you're making an animation for example you can the the animators and and the character they can kind of like interact and there's a single story and single intent and stuff like that but then if there's so many different things that can happen like in a like imagine in fallout 4 when you you have to do all the all the four different things the player can say and then the npc has to react to those and i mean you know i can i can see that that gets very jarring especially yeah. for characters with a lot of dialogue and then you just kind of start you know phoning it because you just yeah. you know it's really hard to now i have to immerse okay now i'm upset at this character and now i feel this and it might be that you don't even necessarily think about what the character is feeling um yeah yeah because it's, it's more than like just that we have to have a sarcastic option every time and yeah. it just exists to have that, but they don't necessarily really think what the other character would feel when the player is being sarcastic. So they just have some general line and, you know, just phone it home. Yeah, it, it comes down to pre-production a lot, I guess. Mm. I would I would, I would think think that's uh, reasonable. And also, I think, uh, like, AAA games, recording voices to tri- AAA games takes several years. Yeah. At least in, Ma- in Mankind Divided, I think... Uh, the voice actor for Adam Jensen's uh, tweeted that it, I think it took like multiple years to record everything mm-hmm. to that. Well, obviously had he had breaks between and you mm-hmm. know, but they uh, I, I suppose that they were during the breaks they were uh, just writing the parts that he would later record mm-hmm. mm. and revisions, of course. That's yeah. why they yeah. the story changes during the production and then they have to re-record stuff. But for but example, I think yeah. I, I think uh, the sound in video games has been overlooked for the longest time. Uh, I think they w- this came to my attention uh, when uh, when would when did Battlefield Three come out? Like, like five years five, ago. I would say five years. I mean, I mean, we have yeah. computers. No. So let's see. You can hear me typing furiously. Um, anyway. 2005. It says here. No, wait. Okay, no, no, so no, it doesn't. 2005 was Battlefield 2. Um, okay. <laughs> 2011. So, yeah. Oh. Seven nice. years soon. Well, yeah, seven years. So before that, I never really even put that much attention to the audio on audio quality. For example, guns and explosions and all that. But when Battlefield 3 came out, I was blown away uh-huh. um, <laughs> by the explosion sounds and all the gunshot sounds and everything. All the how how it felt like there's uh, actual distance between sounds and how the um, area you're in affects how the sound moves in the um, in the air. Mm. And I think that sort of opened my eyes. I guess. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. oh God! Sorry. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, to the uh, like how you can do uh, sounds in games like with uh, like really well and then the way the other people do it like for example comparing the from that time the Call of Duty and uh, Battlefield the sound difference in sound is is just so big that uh, it's it, the uh, I also almost get the feeling like the Call of Duty game, just like, okay, we need sound, but we don't really care what it sounds like, just do it. <laughs> or just put a lot of bass in there so the gun sounds badass. And stuff but that's like the that. thing, like, Call of Duty didn't even have that. They, oh, yeah, yeah. Guns sound like pea shooters. So it's just some, yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, let's take that stock footage and put it here, yeah. and that's it. But yeah, of course, Dice puts a lot of effort into that. But I think that might could be a good topic maybe for um, a future podcast. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, like sounds, absolutely. Sounding games, 
because we have oh, yeah, a lot to talk about there. That wasn't part of narrative, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to talk about sound a lot. Obviously, I, I'm, I have, uh, I have favorites, and I have like, on disfavorites. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, a lot of, a lot of things to talk about, and also good that you mentioned Battlefield, uh, Tommy, because I just went on a humble bundle and checked what I have bought over time, and I have a Battlefield Three Origin. Mm -hmm key here <laughs> and i've never played the game but i have heard somebody say that it uh, it has great audio especially mm -hmm. the gunfire and everything and yeah. you know it would be really interesting to check it out even you know well i'm not against the game in any way but uh especially because of the audio i would like to uh, hear it so maybe audio i'll check visually, it out. it's really really nice the story is oh, just don't even <laughs> and, uh, okay <laughs> And no one's anymore playing the multiplayer, which is a shame because it was better than Battlefield Four. But yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's a nice spectacle. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll talk about sound next, next time, time, or or mm -hmm. or if not, then some other time. But yeah. as for now, uh, thank you for tuning in, and uh, uh, I suppose next time. We'll talk about something, something else. else, or we'll do. A <laughs> we video. may, we may or may not talk about something. <laughs> yeah, yes, we may or may not talk about, or and you may or may not have actual picture of us moving. In addition to the, to the just our voices, depending on how how it goes, because we're kind of alternating between podcasts and and, and vlogs. But we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So, thanks, and see you next time. See ya. See ya.